All right, we have a good number already here. I'm just gonna start by saying a little bit of information about village preservation. Um, I'm Maya, the program associate. I'll be hosting in lieu of Leanne for tonight. Um, here at Village Preservation, we've been documenting, celebrating, and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo since 1980. We work to expand and extend the landmark and zoning protections and stop inappropriate development while encouraging appropriate development in our neighborhoods. We've secured landmark designation for 1,250 buildings in our neighborhood and zoning protections for nearly 100 blocks. We host about 75 free programs every year. Um, we hope to see you at one of our future programs. Um, coming up really soon, we will have our 33rd Village Awards and annual meeting. It's gonna be a fun time to celebrate the local businesses and institutions, organizations and institutions in the area, as well as reflect on Village Preservation's work and mission. All right, so our events cover a wide range of topics focused on history, architecture, and culture, and the important role of historic preservation in our communities and lives. We look at we look and examine the role of everything from small local businesses to independent cultural institutions, civil rights, social justice movements, great artists, writers, musicals, dancers, and others connected to the creative legacy of our neighborhoods, as well as the irreplaceable and unique built environment of of our neighborhoods. We are a member-based organization, so your support is essential to enabling us and to provide this free programming for our community and continue to advocate, continue our, continue our advocacy and preservation work. If you like what, our, what we do, join or make a donation. Um, you can le learn more on our website and please consider becoming a member or making a donation when you're there. So here's just a little bit of Zoom protocol. Um, like, like Leanne already said, all, um, all for all attendees, your video and um, audio will be turned off. However, you can communicate with the host and panelists through, through either the chat function or Q&A. We're gonna hold all questions um, till the end of the discussion, but you can either put them in your, the chat or just ask them directly to us through the Q&A. Of course, we are going to be recording this event as well. We will have we do have captions available. All right, and I'm so delighted to introduce our evening speakers. First up, we have um, Michael David McBride. He resides in Minnesota, but is originally from Michigan. He holds a PhD in 19th century American and 18th century British um, history and literature. His studies primarily revolve around Mark Twain, as well as the intriguing moments of American history from 1780 to 1930. In addition, he's cultivated a habit of reading centuries old newspapers for leisure, a practice he became in 2017, and through which he discovered the great legacy of Merton Clavet. Throughout his career, he's taught English, literature, and communities courses at various institutions and authored several books, including academic books about pedagogy and cultural studies, nonfiction works exploring LGBTQIA history, contemporary fiction, speculative, speculative and science fiction, as well as a series of interactive de detective books for middle grade readers. Uh, as well, we have Chris Lieber, one of the living descendants of Merton Clavet. He and his brother have been working on um, promoting and improving the estate of Merton Clavette that involves documenting, research, archiving, and creating um, do documentary works associated with um, Merton Clavette's legacy. He, he and his brother have just created a, a company called Four Writers LLC devoted to the estate of Merton Clavette, as well as um, Baja Posse LLC, which is currently in plans to create a documentary about Clavette's legacy. So that's all. I'm going to turn it off to the stars of the show. We're going to talk about this amazing and very curious and intriguing man, as well as all the interest um, works he's um, done throughout his time. So great. Thanks so much, Maya. I really appreciate it. Um, tonight, 
just to kind of give you a sense of what, what you have in store, it's kind of a behind the scenes kind of approach, uh, less book reading, but more talking about Merton Clavette, his connection to Greenwich Village, um, what went into the book, how this collaboration came about, um, and then, then towards the end, we'll address kind of what's next. Um, Maya already alluded to the documentary that Chris and Jason are working on. Um, and of course, we'll take your questions as well. So um, I'll begin the introductions and then I'll pass on to, to Chris and let him kind of offer a little bit about his connection as well. Um, Maya introduced me in terms of my scholarship and background. Um, my connection to Merton Clavette begins because I'm reading those papers from 100 years ago. And um, just, you know, flipping through the newspapers and seeing what the headlines are. And it just so happened that one of those headlines said, Vandal shoots painting. And I was intrigued. I needed to know, you know, what inspired somebody to take a shot at a painting. And meanwhile, present day, you know, climate um, activists are attacking art as well. Um, and so there's this weird kind of parallel happening between the 100 year kind of gap. Um, but because I can't find this painting, I search around the internet and find clavette.com and reach out via the contact link. And that's how I end up meeting Chris. And, and Chris, I'm, mm -hmm. I guess I'm wondering, like, <laughs> how did you feel about being kind of cold called and asked about this? Uh, we kind of talked a little bit about that with Lan and and Maya before the for this thing opened up. And honestly, that's what we're looking for. You know, this whole thing, we basically put it out, out as much as we can. We created Wikipedia pages, we've done internet, we've created Twitter accounts, Instagram, Facebook, all that. And that's really it's almost like a siren call to try and put it out to the universe to see who might actually find us. And so we've actually been contacted many times. I've I was actually contacted by uh, the producers at uh, Amazon, Amazon Video. They were doing a movie called uh, The Last Living Boy of New York. And there's actually a Clavette in that paint, uh, Clavette painting in that, in that movie. And so they, they, they actually <laughs> sent a request to us to say if we could give them rights to use this painting. I haven't seen the painting in there, but I'm, I, I do have plans to take a look at it. But it's those kinds of things. We've been contacted by magicians and who who had posters that they would research the poster and say, hey, I've got this poster. It's really cool. Want to learn more about it? And and you'll see some of the posters. Obviously, the, one of them is similar as as the book cover. And we've also had other people come and talk to us. Uh, and it's all about just trying to go ahead and you know put that out there because again, we're trying to reach out and try and find as many people as we can who are interested in this in this topic or know about this topic. Because again, going back to the documentary, we're trying to who would we interview for this movie? Who, you know, we'd need to find experts and people who knew them and or knew about things that were happening at that time. So you coming out of the blue was sort of a was a great. <laughs> I was actually pretty happy because you know at first you know just like you were saying you know, when we spoke via email, it was like who is this guy? But at the end of the day, you know we're actually that's what we're trying to do, and we're trying to continue to do that even with this this uh, this presentation. And so when you came out of nowhere with that, I was like, cool because we had actually been looking to try and get someone to do a monogram already. And so when you came through with the book and actually figured out, okay, it was gonna be a good fit. And that at that point, I felt pretty good about how, where it was going, but, and I learned a lot about the process, but that's how I felt. I, I was fine with it. I think, you know, during this process, we're gonna go ahead and uh, find more people who are interested in this topic, as well as who can help us further move it forward. And so, no, I mean, I think I think, you know, we 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 laid the groundwork for that interaction by getting the clavette.com website and, you know, doing all those other interactions and, and setting the it's it takes time, it takes time to do all that. But that's kind of my 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 explanation on that part. Yeah. And, you know, and I'll, I'll say everyone I talk to is is just fascinated. And, um, you know, as as a researcher, it was really a dream. And, and I forgot to say we will be sharing a bunch of images. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll put the first one up here and I'll explain what this is, uh, which is the, um, let me make sure that works. Okay. Um, this is fr from your archives. This is a photograph of uh, Clavette's shop. And in the upper right-hand corner, you can see 
I guess I don't know which way I'm pointing, but anyway, in the upper right hand corner of the photo, you can see the window is damaged and, and that's where it was shot um, following the attack on this particular painting. And this, this painting was of Woodrow Wilson um, and the passerby um, shot at it because I don't know, offended them or something. I, I'm not sure exactly what happened. Um, but you know, this is the this is the kind of stuff that you just have like laying around and it's amazing, you know, like getting it out there like you are and being able to share it. And um, you know, the the book, The Great Clavette, has a number of these images because you guys were so generous with that. So um I don't know. Do you do you ever find yourself just kind of sifting through your treasure trove of stuff to see what's in there? <laughs> I've done a lot of sifting. I forgot to mention, I actually was contacted by a lady who's a published author. Uh, the book, the name of the book is called um, uh, it's about women's right to vote. It's a, it's a, it's a voting voter, a women's voter right book. And actually Catherine was noted in that book. And so I was actually contacted. And I think one of the paintings, the paintings of the three people, it was the young Juanita, Catherine and, and uh, Merton, that three people up, three up uh, picture, that was also, we gave her rights because figure why not? She's got to get it out there. And so she, her, her uh, book, uh, it, it was out a couple of years ago, but it was, it's that kind of thing where you, you know, people will reach out. But as far as going through some of the stuff, I think I have to say though, working on this book forced me to go through some of that as well. So I had to go back in because because Michael would be like, hey, you got this, you got this. And I, like, I got to look because I mean, this is our opportunity to get it out there. And I don't want to have the book published. And then I say, hey, hey, Michael, we got to do a second edition because I found some more stuff that you need to put in there. But <laughs> you just want to do that. So I was I was pretty we, we documented a lot. We scanned everything in. So I, I was pretty sure. But we had just come back from Florida with some other other uh, archival things as well. And so what happened was I want to make sure there wasn't anything in there that that we missed. But I think we 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 ended up getting most of it in there. Or we've we've found most everything that's been cataloged. And so I think I feel pretty good about what we have. Sure. Um and just I guess for the listeners, I I I, I didn't explicitly state this, but this storefront is in Greenwich Village. Um, it was the Soul Shrine, um, Soul Light oh. Shrine, sorry. Um, and it stood until I think 1923 when they then tore it down. And, and we'll share some photos here in a moment of a trip that that Chris took as well. Um, you can see it on the left-hand side. It says now on view the Soul Light Shrine and you can see it on the left-hand side of that photo. Yeah. And the other connection that I was sharing just before we uh, went live was when I was going back 100 years in the newspapers, uh, tomorrow, um, June 9th, 1923, um, they debuted the Thomas Paine bronze in Greenwich Village. And that was part of Merton Clavette's wife, Catherine Parker Clavette. Um, she established the initial Greenwich Village Historical Society in 1922, and she did a lot to, um, you know, commemorate moments and famous people and those kind of things around the village. So, um, so those are some of the explicit kind of connections to the area. But um, do you want me to flip through some of the the photos from your trip, and we can talk about those? Yeah, we can go through that. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. So that's one Sheridan Square. That's where Martin is. There was some scaffolding up. This is a trip from uh, 29, uh, 29 2019, we were at a wedding in Philly and we ended up making a partial trip over to New York and checking that out. And so I'm like, I gotta go back to the village. And so that was me in front of one Sheridan Square. That's on the side part. You, if, off to my, to my, off to the right of the photo is actually the front of the building that we'll see later. But that's first picture. They're doing some renovations. That's the front of the building kind of just you kind of see it it's hard to see at this point but that's kind of how it looks how it was in the front you can see the scaffolding as well there's the building uh, so you can see that kind of corner and so if, if you look to the left of this photo you go around the corner that's where i was originally but that's you know that's that was a uh, jesse tarbox beals photo she did a, uh, they did a lot of photos uh, back then but that's Clavette's corner as it says in there and and so I tried to 
I tried to do the best I could to preserve a lot of these photos. So I had to do a lot of Photoshop work, but I think they came out pretty good. Yeah, I agree. They're gorgeous to look at. And is that Clavette right in front of it? I know he's almost always predominantly in front of the store, but I can't quite tell from that. It looks interesting. It doesn't look like something he would wear. Yeah. <laughs> that guy's wearing a suit or something. <laughs> but uh, can't tell. All right, so there's Merton. So the left and on the left side, so you can see the left side front and then you can see the right and that's from Google Images. And that's actually an optometry shop that's in, in the village now. And so that's, they got rid of the bottom part, but now you can kind of see where the shop was for, so he, in the bottom part, he had, at the top part, he had his gallery, he had a, a studio as well as a shop, so in living quarters, so he had kind of a three level thing going, but you can see in this same kind of, same, same pictures, but just kind of smaller. I like this just because it kind of shows uh, the before, uh, before and after. Yeah, I agree. And, and the, that shop, I mean, like you said, I mean, he sold curios, he sold books, he sold paintings, he had the gallery above it. Like it was, it was all kinds of stuff. And um, I mean, it was from what I can read. I mean, it was really kind of a lifeblood of the area. People came there, artists from artists and musicians and people who wanted to collaborate mm -hmm. and, and just be part of that. So. Oh, no, it's definitely. And, and, I, I realized we didn't really give much of a bio of him, but like, what's interesting to me too, is this is really kind of a, a late career change. You know, this is the second half of his life. He lives in Greenwich village. Uh, before then he is traveling all around doing performances as magician, as, um, you know, doing sleight of hand, doing shadowgraphy, doing a variety of things. And we'll probably talk a little more about his bio later, but, um, you know, at this point of his life, he's lived a whole life. And then now he's starting again and, and doing a variety of things right there in the village. But I'll skip to the, mm -hmm. the next one here. Yeah. This is uh, our condo. <laughs> I invited, see, the, the, the guy in the back with the thumb up, that's my producing partner, Andrew. He He's going to help with the movie. And he's been helping me kind of navigate some of the, we worked on a lot of projects together. The guy on the right is, a, is an actor and voice actor. We brought him down to the condo just to look at the art because the reason why this was, the, what we did with this particular project was to put, pull out all the art, bring the art, bring the narrator in and have him. And he was going to do a lot of promotional videos for us. So we, we brought him in and a narrator in and, and we basically created little snippets that you can see right now on Instagram for Martin Clavette's account. And they're just, little mini documentaries like 20 second 30 seconds and they're curated the, the script was written i was i read the script using a lot of the clavette's information and a lot of his even some of his own words and so that's this is a fun picture of uh, chris is his name he um just to kind of get him into character he plays all the clavette voices and if you've heard any of our clavette uh, book intro uh, voices he's doing those as well as the carnival barker and his carnival barker is awesome he 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 plays the great carnival barker just come on and get the club out and he's just that's chris so uh that was a little photo i thought just to show you know behind the scenes of what we're trying to do and so we could pop to that next photo i think of him and we're in the studio yeah so chris again this is my our friend todd he's a he's a magician in on in hollywood he's done everything uh, you can imagine um, this is his. This was actually his home studio. We we recorded Chris here, but uh, Todd's actually also been. I've been kind of. He's a friend of ours. He works over at Fonco Studios. Has his own uh, voice uh, studio. It's called TV Studio, and so we're just working with him, trying to tee him up as far as uh, utilizing his property where he works to do the documentary, to do maybe some recreation things like that. But but this is just a fun photo of uh, Chris and I. Uh, doing some voiceover work for that was the original the first set of voiceover work the second set of voiceover work i had chris just recorded on and he sent it to me and then i i edited it into those most recent book uh promos yeah i know um one of the, there are, we'll, we'll share a couple um slides that show some of the sketchbooks but one of the ones that i kept returning to over and over again was the um some of his magic tricks where he broke down, you know, I mean, it, 
it would make sense to a magician, but not necessarily to me. I, I know that at one point you had mentioned reaching out to magicians. Did you ever have any traction figuring out what some of the tricks were or? Um, not too much. Um, we still have, we have a guy, actually, that's kind of, a, that's another interesting point is that the number one guy at, one of the number one guys in, in magic on the West Coast or even in the U.S. is actually, I was put in contact with him and we were talking to him because his friend was the one that contacted me early about his poster. Now, this guy is actually a board member of the Magic Castle in L.A., and so this guy, they, they, they actually shipped this guy out to uh, England about three months ago to go set up a magic show out there. So this guy's a pretty heavy hitter. So I think eventually we're going to have to connect with him again, just because I think once we get more traction with the documentary, I'd like to, to get his feedback on some things. Maybe we can shoot you know, in the Magic Castle. That'd be kind of awesome. But I didn't necessarily, but I, I try and keep, I don't try and be a constant pest with a lot of these folks. I just... <laughs> I want to make the connections and kind of keep that live, but not necessarily go and be like, Hey, you know, what's going on? You know, and you know, we'll get to that point, but I think having that contact, that guy, I think he could definitely help project uh, in some ways. Maybe we can make it worth his while as well, but it's just, it's all about putting it out there. That guy, the meeting with the guy who lives in Pasadena came from another guy who I'd met, you know, back in 2015 who had his poster and then I reconnected with him as we were getting more momentum and, and that's when we did this whole kind of he said the guy that I'd met earlier said well I've been kind of keeping this close to my vest but I actually have some clavettes and you're going to want to talk to this other guy who's in in LA <laughs> so it's just and then he talked to him and he was obviously on his trip and when he got back but again it's just all about you know connecting with you know different folks but now we never did get i didn't get too much on that but hey who knows i think i think a lot of the stuff they did is similar and the thing is the guy the, the guy in la i mean he he's gonna know you know and that was part of the whole connecting was to try and figure out if we could find people who are magicians now who could look at what Colette was doing and say yeah he must have been doing this he must have been doing this and kind of you know you know making some judgments about it but also making informed judgments about what could be, could have been going on at that time yeah i mean i know as part of my research i read a bunch of books about magic and tried to find books that were kind of do it yourself how to things that would have been published around the time that clavette was learning um and you know i mean i mentioned earlier that he was traveling around he was on the orpheum circuit um and part of the downtime, I believe, from what I can tell about other people who are on the Orpheum circuit is they traded secrets with one another. They taught each other, you know, their act so that everybody on vaudeville could kind of do a variety of things, even if they didn't perform them just out of sheer boredom, you know, you're on the train for a couple <laughs> hours, like you may as well learn something. So um, I, I know um, I, I definitely saw him as a, a kindred spirit to me because I, I'm just wildly curious. And so for me, like having you respond <laughs> and being like this, um, you know, kind of like Google search for me, it's like, Chris, do you have this? And then you, you get back with me. And, um, and that was, that was really a dream come true on that, but I'll, I'll skip here to the next one. That one I just wanted to throw out there. That's, that's the four writers. So if you look at it, it's a four writers LLC that was shown in the, that was shown in the New York uh, evening world, September 17th, 1919, as an article. This you can see on our website. We have all of the reviews that are on the website at clavette.com, but this particular painting is great. It's just a, it's a masterpiece. If you look at the painting on the faces aren't jockeys, they're actually village vamps. So like you're talking Greenwich village vamps. So Clavette's known for his village vamps. He did about 60 or so vamps and you have a picture of his vamp wall of all the different uh, ladies that were uh, living around at that time. And that's what this is. And I just figured this would be a great image to show everybody to see kind of his impact and what was going on. Sure. Well, and just to, to help with the timeline. So Clavette is born in 1868 in Wisconsin, Portage, Wisconsin. And he is, um, from there, you know, he, he moves west with his mom to, was it Wyoming territory? Yeah. And then ends up um, running away to the Wild West show and joins Buffalo Bill for a while and then joins the circus. Um, and then 
ends up kind of in Seattle for a time, and then San Francisco, which is where the Orpheum is beginning. Um, and from there, he tours the Orpheum circuit. And if you don't know anything about the Orpheum circuit, um, there were two competing vaudeville kind of tours, and the Orpheum was essentially Chicago and West. Um, and one of the big differences with the Orpheum circuit was because they had so much ground to travel, mm -hmm. they actually paid the performers um, while they were traveling. So they earned a salary instead of just getting paid on a performance, which was really unique. Um, so by the time we get to 1919 in this exhibition, you know, he's he's an old man at that, well, older man at that point. Um, he also, during his life, you know, well, as you know, like he, he lied about how old he was, you know, he used to say he was 20 years older and he grew a mustache and could pull that off. So um, <laughs> it was funny reading all the obituaries uh, when, when he passed because almost every single one of them commented on how surprised everybody was to learn that he was actually only 62, well, or 61. I can't remember if he'd actually had his birthday yet, um, but they thought he was 80 years old. Um, and so everybody was surprised that he was as young as he was, but um, all right, let's see what you got next here. All right, Jason. So this is this is my brother, Jason. He's got his Mastodon shirt on and his son has a matching Mastodon shirt. <laughs> Yay, we like music. Um, this particular picture here is at the Orange County Fine Arts Storage Unit, which is now a different uh, company. They merged with another company, but a national uh, group, but this is just a great, you can see the super tall picture of uh, Mer Merton. <laughs> that thing is a ginormous oil painting. It's like, I don't know, eight feet tall. And to the right, you can see some other picture, but this is actually to the right, you can see there's a, there's a painting, it's an oil painting, and that's a rack. So we, were, we moved our art over to this particular location because it's just a little bit better. It's, a, it's set up for that. But on the right, you can see all those boxes, those, those black museum boxes all filled with gouache paintings. They need to find a home, by the way. But, um, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so so that's part of it. But that's just a fun picture. Um, we haven't put this is not on the social media or anything like that. So I just thought, eh, let's let's throw this out there, and, and so people could kind of see what it's like to try and just deal with. That's just one rack of paintings, <laughs> but but uh, just a kind of a fun uh, behind the scene type photo. Yeah. That's the location, Orange County Fine Art Storage. So what we did was um, they, they, were, they were in the middle of taking down some of their paintings and they're like, well, we have this, this it's a private location, but people that are art, um, people that know art go there. There's, there's art dealers, brokers, um, auction house brokers that go in here and customers and that kind of thing. So figured why not, let's get some art up. So we paid them to have some of these paintings uh, put up in this little gallery. Um, as you can see on the left, there's Village Vamp, there's a couple of, in the front, as from the left, there's a couple still lifes. The back wall has a large fish. Uh, there's a couple of landscape paintings, and then kind of that big one off to the left is the is the snake uh, attacking the the tiger. So a jungle jungle argument. That's a pretty famous painting as well. But this is just a nice, just to kind of see what what we're dealing with as far as you know what we're doing now. And, and right now it's just kind of to get it out there, let people see what it's all about and learn more about this crazy, awesome artwork. And these are all oil paintings, mind you. So most of the stuff we've seen that's pretty clean is all gonna be a gouache painting. We go into that, what that is, but gouaches are just a little bit different paint. They're not oil. Uh, they're not acrylic because there wasn't acrylic at that time, but, but these are the ones that were ready to go and actually ready to, at one point, ready to be sold. Uh, as well. So they were cleaned up and ready to go. Yeah. And it is interesting. Like I had never heard of a gouache before. Um, and b before I had encountered Clavette's work and started talking to you about it. And, and I was actually an art history minor major at one point in my college career. So it was, it was interesting to learn about this whole different style of painting mm -hmm. um, or medium that I just didn't even know about. Um, and then the more I learned about it, the more I realized lots of other artists also used them. And I'm mm -hmm. not sure exactly why the preference was given to oils because the gouaches seem to retain their color beautifully and just are really vibrant. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about the gouaches before we move on? 
Uh, no, other than the fact that I learned a lot about gouaches from reading the book. So <laughs> go ahead and go and buy that book. <laughs> it was, I was like, wow. Because he, he talks about the gouache, how it sort of goes on flat and it dries bright, which is kind of an interesting concept. But no, I mean, you can tell why the oil, the oils look really good. The oils yeah. look really nice, really nice. And I, when you look at them, you know why that those were given preference. But no, the gouaches are great. A hundred years later, they look great. They look great on everybody's wall. It just, it's just, <laughs> you, well, you saw them in the other photo. The other photo yeah. we had, had all those gouaches that were in the living room. That was, I mean, you could see the color and that's great. Sure. But what do we got next here? Yep. There's, okay, so there's Jungle Argument. I'm in the... And they're just kind of, actually, that was funny. I, I, I put the, I put the video, I put my phone on a video camera on a tripod and I just kind of recorded it. And I, I did a pull, I pulled that still frame, but essentially that's, you can see kind of as abstract art. So that's the way he did his art. You can see the, the snake off to the left where I'm pointing and then down is where the, the tiger is. And then off to the left, you've got a nice oil, kind of a seascape, kind of an oil ping. And then off to the right, you got a portrait. So I just put this in because I thought, give you an idea of you know what are we who are we talking about here I mean what you know what are we talking about and I think based on you could look off to the right the quirky distortions and left the abstract it sort of predates the whole abstract expressionist movement at that time at, at that time they're really only having a lot going on in like Germany like uh, Noldi and some of those guys so this actually Clavette actually did predate a lot of stuff that we see later on and that's part of what we're trying to do is just kind of put him in context with the rest of that. But, but no, that's just a, I like this paint, this shot because it shows kind of a, a mixture of some of his oil paintings. Well, and also gives a sense of scale as well. You know, sometimes, mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard, you know, in the book, the pictures are, you know, we made them as big as we could, <laughs> but, you know, yeah. it doesn't really do it justice when you, when you see it on a wall next to a person, uh, you really get a sense of that. And, you know, all these paintings are ones that he was doing um, while living in Greenwich Village. And, you know, they were, but he also traveled the world. I mean, he went to England and India and New Zealand and, you know, mm -hmm. he was all over the place. So, you know, if you wonder, if anybody wonders about the you know, why this content? I mean, I suspect there are things he saw, you know, you know and, you know, made sketches of along the way. I, I don't know if there's, I know it, there's lots of, um, you know, lots of scrapbooks and that kind of thing, but I, I have to imagine, you know, that he's drawing from these kind of memories of things that stuck out to him, especially he's with got... like the, the sheer number of fishes that he drew that are just, those are the ones that for me are just gorgeous. I mean, they show the movement and just the vibrant colors and, um, all of that, but yeah, there's definitely at clavette.com under the in the gallery section, you can go in there. And we put we put kind of in order. Actually, uh, we talked to our aunt, who is uh, she's a artist and art historian herself. We got a lot of information from them. They did a lot of work. Uh, the the grandson Ted, our late Ted Aiken, the, the husband, but we we actually asked her how to put those together. And so what we did was we put together a, what's called a virtual gallery. And so if you were to go into a gallery and you see, you know, this painting first, the next one, as you walk through the gallery, you'd see it in, in an order. And so if you go to our uh, website, clipette.com, you'll see in the gallery view, if you click on the first painting and then you see the second painting and the third painting, it's kind of in an order. So if you go through those in order, you'll see kind of what it would look like if you were to go into, a, into, a, into an actual gallery without knowing how big they are, but <laughs> some of them are pretty big. <laughs> sure. But um okay so these are actually from the scrapbooks that we were talking about so one of the one of the joys of um as a researcher is somebody who takes meticulous notes and you know leaves a record behind you know it is it is so hard to find firsthand accounts of what people were thinking or you know their their journals or their diaries or their letters. I mean, those things are ephemeral and they they disappear. You know, they're they're used and they're they're gone. Um, but Clavette um, and and Catherine and Juanita, for that matter, their daughter, all did a really good job of scrapbooking and meticulously keeping notes and writing notes to themselves as well. Um, Oh, can you say something about like I, I don't know what the actual scrapbooks look like. I mean, I've only ever seen the scans. What 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 are what kind of 
how are they bound or what what does that look like? Uh, they, were in a big, they were in a big binding book and they're they're huge. Like so that page right there is probably a uh, bare, or barely fit on a I don't think it wouldn't even fit on my normal scanner. I was I had to, I was at another company at the time and I was actually took the scrapbooks into work and scanned them on bigger on a bigger scanner, actually on a nice scanner at work. And it was funny, if you go on a Monday and you see people would look in the it's a funny story. They go into the copier room and see little dust everywhere, like little pieces of dust. It's like, what happened in here? Uh, I was just scanning about a hundred, you know, pages of this old dusty book, but because those little pieces, you could see the paper, you know, there's stuff kind of flakes off. But no, it's it's pretty big. Some of them are a little bit smaller, but but yeah, they're definitely big. This particular one I like to see on the left hand side. You can see that's a Greenwich Village Historical Society Inc. They were announcing a gala, and so there's a lot of little basic things like that. We have little invitations and things, but I like this one because it was more of a, a main event kind of thing. And it, and so this that thing on the left is actually not the full page, whereas the one on the right is kind of more of a full page. So the rest of these, you'll see they're full pages. So you can kind of see how big they are. They're like 11 by 17 type size, this particular book. And so, but you can see that middle picture. If you go online, like just go on Amazon and type in Clavette, you're going to see the two cats uh, thing on there. That's the original two, one of the original two cats uh, pictures as well. But, and then that picture of Merton in there as well, his, uh, that's in the book. And then the fun part about these, and I just wanted to throw these in and we're not going to spend too much time on these scrapbooks, but just to give you a sense for what they were and what, what Michael wanted to see is like what, what he was working with as far as original material. Cause you really don't, it's hard to really imagine say, oh yeah, you, you know, we got, you know, original information, original provenance and all that from the state and that, but until you actually see it, you don't really kind of really realize. And then as far as the, the writing. So even some of the little funny things that he would write in here, some of it just snarky, a lot of snarky comments in here, but it's just funny. But, but the snarkiness of it, creates a sort of a, a theme for his how he thought and I think that's what Michael was using in his besides that in his book and how he wrote and then there's interviews of him and his quotes and stuff use all of that to create a persona that becomes the persona of this book and so it was all based in what we found here yeah and I I, I... I know at one point we we talked about whether it would be kind of a, a traditional third person kind of biography or what we wanted to do and it just it, it didn't really feel to do him justice so anybody you know, for for listeners if you pick up the book you're going to see it's written in first person it's it's as if you know Merton is kind of deathbed confessional kind of reflecting back on his life um and uh, you know, at the end, there is an essay that breaks down exactly kind of why we did that and, um, you know, any of the liberties we mm. took and that kind of thing. But, you know, I, I really got such a strong sense of his character between, you know, reading letters, reading journals, reading, you know, like kind of diary, the scrapbooking, you know, sometimes there's an image on the scrapbook and then he like is pointing at it and then writes a little thing off to the side and you just, you really get a sense of, who he was and you know if i if i were to imagine what he would want his autobiography to look like it, it wouldn't be you know it wouldn't be a kind of stodgy boring biography you know he would want something that has more flair and is more experimental than that so um so that was really the the choice there but like like chris said i mean we have these documents you know like you know, it's just, it's amazing, like, again, as a researcher to be able to go through and, and read this stuff and, and see what they're saying and how they're reacting to things. Also, I'm sad you just switched the page again, more of his stuff, you can see even the, where the picture of his mom and then off to the bottom right, it says Clavette in that, in that perfect, at how he always writes his name, but it's just, I mean, even in this particular, in that comment, I think that's some, if you read it, it says something like, she probably knew how great I was going to be when I became, I, it's, it was just, it's so funny, but, um, and off to the right, him as a younger man, but, but yeah, so this is, that's a scrapbook. I actually, I pulled these images from the scans. I had, and we scanned everything and it's all PDF. So I just did an export as JPEG to get these images in. And then he put them in as up as two ups, but each of those one ups are like an eight and a half by 11 sure. or 11 by 17 ish size. Gotcha. All right, let's see. We I think we can dip more. through that. 
I think there's one more sketchbook yeah. one. Okay, and this yeah. actually then has the sketch of one Sheridan Square. Yeah, exactly. So there's that one. It's kind of a fun one on the left. That was him in this magic thing. Juanita's on the right in in, in her house, probably somewhere. And uh, yeah, and then just there was a lot of cool. I love his sketches. <laughs> I mean, we didn't even touch on the sketches. I've got like 50 or 100 sketches, just him doodling and creating people and all sorts of things. I think they're the coolest thing. I, I just haven't put them out in public because I don't want someone to look at it. And I mean, call me paranoid, but like, what's this? You know, why are you putting that at? It's not a finished product, whatever. But I, I, I just kind of like checking it out. But there's a lot of cool stuff that we haven't even scratched the surface on. And we'll just kind of tease it out. But who knows? Uh, hopefully someday we'll be able to put some more of that in there and maybe the movie or wherever. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to go to the next one here. So these are, these are posters that you guys have. And, you know, again, I mentioned that he was a magician, that he, you know, he was a acrobat or equilibrist, you know, like part of it also of doing this was just like learning new words. Like what is the equilibrist? Uh, you know, and once you look it up, it, it makes sense. Um, you know, is it something he invented? No, like actually other people were called equilibrious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but there certainly was a, an attempt to, to make it sound more exotic than, um, than we would. And like with the finger silhouettist, you know, I think people today would casually call it shadow puppets. And, um, but, you know, reading the reviews of his act was just, was just remarkable. Uh, you know, people would talk about going, sorry. So in the vaudeville setting, I just just for those who don't know, there's usually seven or eight acts. And the way it's broken down is the first act is an up and comer, somebody who, you know, whether they get an audience or not, it's fine because most people who go to vaudeville really care about acts three to mm -hmm. six. Um, so like the first act is kind of a throwaway. People are coming, they're setting up. Um, second and third act, they kind of build. Um, and there's usually a theme, like the second, fourth, and sixth act are usually the same kind of act or kind of on the same plane, you know, so you kind of see a progression of music or a progression of um, magic or medium or any of those things, you know, throughout that. When, when you get to the seventh act the, or eighth, depending on exactly how many they have, that's the chaser. And the job of that act is to make people leave. Because in the vaudeville, you could just sit there all day if you wanted to, and it just repeats. Um, and so the chaser's job was to like make people go away. And I, I could imagine a lot of comedians that would do wonders these days with like hecklers and that kind of stuff. But sometimes the chaser act was somebody sitting there sculpting or telling really bad jokes or, you know, just doing things that will make people get up and go. And the finger silhouettist was a headlining act. Like he would get up there, he would perform with this black screen behind him and um, electric light because that was relatively new at the time. It was predict it was projectable and predictable. And he would not only make these shadow puppets, but then he would also voice them and sing. I mean, it was a it was a whole thing. Um, and, and I just, I mean, these are my favorite thing. You talk about the sketches. I would, I would love to see more of the sketches for sure too. Um, but these posters, like between kind of the braggadocious mm -hmm. one on the, on the left-hand side <laughs> about every nerve and muscle and bone and tendon, um, and then just kind of the glorious images, um, of the finger silhouettist one. Um, I just kind of love these, but yeah, we got, I think one more poster here um which is from his his magic days as well um and i don't know i i love the weird little alien demon things i'm not sure exactly what they are um those show up on a couple different of his his posters i know um you know do you have any any reflections or thoughts on any of the um, posters this is a conversation starter this is kind of the poster the type of poster that would have gotten me an email to say hey i bought this poster from that guy bob out in uh, on the i think he's out in i want to say get where he's at somewhere in new england maybe concord maybe yeah i think he's in new hampshire actually but that kind of thing so it would be that and it's just one of those things where it's cool i mean it's kind of off the wall <laughs> the great club that i mean 
we can use that he did all these posters he created the great clavette and it's kind of like wow we could just use that as the name of the book and use his poster and that whole thing but these posters are just gems i mean that there's people magic people looking for these posters in in mint condition and one of them he actually bob actually had his restored whatever that means i don't know how you restore a poster but <laughs> he did it so yeah so yeah and so but no i got nothing on that but did you want to go into anything about the um the book itself as far as um i mean you talked about the book being his first voice um you know this is just a a part of nonfiction kind of thing you were going to take it there's a quick blurb on that sure yeah i mean um you know a couple of people have asked about you know how do you classify the book you know is it is it nonfiction or not and you know i, I guess i would i would definitely say it is is definitely nonfiction. i mean maybe it's creative nonfiction in the fact that we have you know recreated his voice but we've used quotes directly from his letters and from his you know, from his reactions to things, you know, so it is, it's deeply researched, it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't just kind of casually um, attacked that way, like it was, it was very thoughtful the way we went about writing it in his voice, and, you know, I've included as many references as I can, so at the end, there's a long source of the resources that we used, um, how we documented it, that essay at the end, you know, definitely kind of spells it out. But, you know, any, anytime you undertake something, whether it's a book or a movie, um, and you try to recapture the truth, you know, it, it is just one version of that truth. You know, any any number of different perspectives will see it in a slightly different way. Um, and, you know, you only have so many pages, too. You know, there are thousands and thousands of books about Lincoln. And, you know, if, if there was one truth, you would only have one book. So, I, I mean, that perspective, I think, is is, is certainly important there. Um, so when people ask me, is it true? It's it's as true as it possibly can be, I guess is what I would say. You know, and if we need to put out a volume two at some point because you find some other gem in storage, by all means, well, you can certainly do that. <laughs> but, definitely, definitely. Clavette is a man of the world, and I think this is a way of getting his voice out to the world. I think, you know, that's, that was the main thing. It's, it's, there's no, you know... My whole thing with, you know, people coming up and say, hey, what's it like to have someone sort of try and find out more about what's going on and asking a lot of questions? I think the bottom line is just trying to get this interesting, crazy, fun, you know, innovative person out to the world and let them see more about what he's doing, what he did and, you know, what impact he had and maybe also learn a few things. And I know you you talked a little bit about that as well, as far as just reinventing yourself and whatnot. But. But yeah, no, definitely, definitely good to um, to get this out there. It's very, yeah. I think, I think the book itself is very, it's a, it's a very, it takes everything we know this time, puts it in a nice, clean, cogent air, uh, book. So you could just pick the thing up and, and check it out. Because what? I think there was so much stuff going on. And you're going to learn a lot from the book itself, just because, you know, there's, you know, what we fill in. We could fill in some certain things, but we fill it in with actual facts, like what was going on at the orphan circuit? What's this like? What's that like? You know, and sort of it's the life and times of Clavette. So you're going to get to <laughs> learn about the times and how he fits into those times. And, you know, and actually when you look at it with, within those, within that context, you can juxtapose between what he was doing and what normal people were doing at that time. And it's, it's kind of insane to think about this guy traveling the world 20 times I mean, I've done, a, I've gone to a couple different continents and stuff, but 20 times around the world, that's, I mean, even nowadays, that's kind of a lot. So yeah, when you think of the boat, sheer time crazy. he would have, sheer time he would have spent on a boat. I mean, it's just, it is incredible to think about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, he, for me, I mean, he is such a Renaissance man in so many ways, you know, and that idea of just kind of reinventing himself over and over again, you know, whether you're on vaudeville or, you know, whether mm -hmm. then you're, you're painting or the next slide, you know, sculpting Lincoln. And why did he sculpt? Because he learned sculpting from Rodin, like the thinker guy. Like, how does that happen? You know, like, <laughs> just happened to be in Europe. So, you know, you learn from Rodin, but... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We were talking about the gouaches earlier, and these are these are some of the ones. And these 
actually are, are ones that you could win. So Chris, do you want to tell them about the raffle? Yeah, I'll just do a quick blurb on that. Essentially, if you went to greatclavette.com, Michael's taking everybody's name who you know enters into the raffle and we're going to pick one lucky winner to p get one of these paintings. So the painting itself, these are all the gouaches. I thought I, I'm not, not really following the chat, but I think someone's asking about what a gouache was or something about a gouache, but these are what they would look like. And so one of the three you would get to pick out. Uh, obviously we want people to buy the book. <laughs> so it's kind of set it up to where, you know, originally we set it up to where you go to that website, pre-order the book, and then Michael will send it to you and then also enter you into the contest for the gouache. But I just thought it'd be cool to get uh, this out in front of people and gives us a chance to go ahead and see what, um, you know, see, we get to show them three different kind of gouaches. One, the, the one on the top right is called the Seascape Calm. We got a Seascape Tempest on the bottom left, and then I've got a group fish on the right. And so we just, I figured, why not give somebody an option to pick one of the three? So whoever the winner is, they could pick one of the three and then they go ahead and, you know, pick one of those and we'll send it to you. We can yeah. also tell you how you would frame it and that kind of thing. Obviously, we're not framing it for you, but uh, we can give you all the specs or the recipe to, to actually frame it. We have that as well because we kind of got a, we got a formula for that as well. Yeah, and if you're, I mean, if you're wondering about the gouache, I mean, it, it is, I, I think of it as kind of like a marriage between watercolor and oil. And like, like Chris was saying, acrylic wasn't a thing then. So it, it's kind of like that, but it, I mean, they're, they're just vibrant and beautiful. I mean, one of the things that Clavette really does is I, I kept thinking of them as kind of like a, a missing link mm -hmm. really between kind of mm -hmm. like what came before and abstract and expressionist and impressionism, you know, like he's just, he's in there and it feels like somehow, at least in the art history classes I took, it was like this came and then this, and somehow we skipped him entirely. Um, and I, I don't understand quite why, because I mean, he has his own solo show in Perry and, you know, it's, it's incredible. Like when you think about, the life he had before and then reinventing himself as a painter and sculptor and then being one of the only American or or the only I, I don't remember which now to yeah, actually they, be invited one of the only Americans to have a solo show at the Bernheim June yeah you know it's it's incredible and these painting the fact that these paintings have you know, that, that you guys have this amazing collection, it's awesome. And that you're willing to help get them out in the world um, is, is great, so. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure where we are. Were you wanted to cover more of the indie, indie um, writer thing at all? Or what do you want to do? Just trying um, to keep back on time. Yeah, no, I think we got about probably five minutes and then we should probably leave some time for, for questions. So what if we, what if we instead, um, I'll, I'll end just by sharing one of my favorite photos towards the end of his life. Um, I, I didn't have a date on this one, um, but it, based on the other images around the time of his obituary, this looks like probably in his sixties, at least, um, 61, 62. And, um, I don't know. I mean, you've talked a little bit about the documentary. Do you want to talk more about kind of what's next for you with that? I think I did. I think I covered most of it, you know, when we're talking about that, but, you know, for the most part, the next steps is to, I mean, my, my idea would be what actually when my aunt and uncle were, or when my aunt and her husband, Pat, were looking at the, working with the collect, collection back in the 2000s, you know, my idea was, hey, you guys should do a documentary because if you're trying to get us get the name out word out there, why not do a documentary? It never happened, but I could. And then so then there was many iterations of figuring out what should we do, kind of documentary. We put it out to the world. We were hoping that maybe we could get some interest and people would latch on to it. But again, at the end of the day, we ended up sort of figuring out that maybe a 10 to 12 minute documentary would be good as a starting point because at that point, we've already learned, I've already done a lot of other projects with some friends in LA who work in movies and that kind of thing. So I've learned a lot about that. And so I've actually, part of making a documentary is getting actual, um, you know, a, a location and a, you know, sound guy. Actually, in this case, we don't need sound, but the critical, the critical factors in this particular would be editor, uh, editor, narrator, 
and then also location and a DP. And so for us, we're at that point where a 10 to 12 minute movie would be awesome. I think it'd be a nice st starting point and then uh, we can make it of a high quality. Um, in 2008, it might not have been as high quality, but I think even in the last three years, we've learned a lot. I've worked on a lot of projects. I've met Todd, who, who's obviously been doing this forever. He's got uh, his location over at Fonco Studios, so they've got a location. I'm in the process of trying to reconnect with one of our DPs who worked on our original projects, but now he's so busy that he's doing feature films and he does any music, he does almost every music video um, that you've seen of any big artist. Um, this is a friend of ours, uh, nephew. And so he actually, his name is Josh Reese. So I'm trying to see if he might want to work with us. Otherwise, we've got another great uh, DP who we worked with on our last pilot, my, my buddy Andrew's pilot uh, for a spec uh, TV show, like a comedy. And he's great to work with. And so as far as documentary, it's just about trying to connect with all these people. And it really is what they say about making movies. It's about you know, networking and, and who you know and, and meeting people. And the best, pe the best way to get these people is to say, hey, we well, got this book to just keep out, literally. <laughs> so that was my whole thing was, Josh, I want you to get this book and I want to tell you about the project. And if he's too busy, then we've got another person. But that's where the documentary is. I think it would be great to just I think we're at a good point now where it's everything's sort of kind of um, heading in one direction. So yeah. we'll see. We'll see how it goes. You know, well, knows? <laughs> and you have a you, you have plenty of other material out there if anybody wants to work on information about Catherine or Juanita. I'm actually in the process of putting the book out there, one of the pre-orders came in from Canada and it was somebody who is working on one of Juanita's books or a collection of poetry. I'm not sure exactly. Um, and so like, it is interesting and just kind of kismet that these things are kind of happening at the same time. I, th I think you're right. I mean, the more you put it out there, the more connections you'll find. And, 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 you know, I mean, hopefully someone in the village has something and maybe someplace in somebody's attic or hanging on a wall somewhere uh there's that Woodrow Wilson painting and I'll finally get <laughs> yeah. my my uh, <laughs> my wish of seeing what uh, you know inspired somebody to actually shoot at it so <laughs> exactly well it's funny you talk about like paintings you don't see I mean there's a painting of that uh Clavette did of Rodin and supposedly it was like the best picture of Rodin ever <laughs> if you believe that kind of thing but it no we do have a picture of I think it's up on our Instagram but but yeah, yeah, we'll definitely, I think overall, I think the whole process has been great. Uh, we kind of, we glossed over this, but again, just being an indie author, it's just a lot to, to do as far as the book. But, you know, we were, we looked at it like we're a team, you know, we wanted this, this book to get out there. It's a great, great concept, a great thing to get out there. And then also, you know, sharing what we have. So we want it to be as accurate as possible. And so to be able to do that is, I think it worked out well. And then also just us learning about the industry, what it's like to put out a book. And, and I think everything's gonna start kind of falling into place, like I said, with the book. And then maybe that becomes the next thing where someone sees the book and says, wow, it'd be really cool to have a movie. We actually were on a, he was on a podcast and they were talking about it and they wanted to do a, a movie. And we're like, oh, we could have Christian Bale be the uh, Clavette, who would be awesome. <laughs> I was like, cool. Yeah, that's, the, how, that's how I could see him definitely doing that. I mean, in the vein of like that movie, The Prestige with Christopher Nolan's movie. But again, that's sure. a very, very big budget. <laughs> yeah, so. I know. Um, it was the the Shared History podcast with Nat and Cass, and they were throwing around all kinds of possibilities. Um, and that was kind of funny. I think one point it was Nicolas Cage, Christian Bale, Daniel Day Lewis. You know, also you know that that shouldn't actually. Be that's that, who I was. That shouldn't actually, be too much of a stretch. He played Lincoln, actually, you know, at least kind of period appropriate. So <laughs> you're correct. I, I meant to say Daniel Day Lewis. I'm sorry. I totally bombed that one. That's all right. We'll forgive you. My my original <laughs> thought was Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> there will be blood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um well, Maya, would would you help us with any any questions so that we can do that part before we fill the time? Yeah, of course. So we can start with the Q&A. Um, I believe first someone had a question about the name of the movie on Amazon Prime you mentioned. Oh, it was uh, Last Living Boy in New York, I believe. Mm -hmm. Something about the Last Living Boy in New York or the, yeah, something like that. I believe that's what it was. Let me, let me check. Well, he but does I'll that. Put... The final slide is the, the cover of the book. I failed to show that one, so. 
Oh yeah. So yeah, you can definitely put the link in the chat. Um, sure. Another question we have is we had a question. Oh, from... I'm sorry, Maya. The yeah. only living boy in New York. It came out in 2017. Okay. Yep. Great. Director Mark Mark Webb. Uh, we also had a question about um, Merton Clavette's sexuality. So could you maybe talk a little bit about um, his his personal life and a little bit of what that was like? Hard to say. <laughs> I, th I would I would think he I, I don't know actually if he was I, I'm assuming he's straight. But um, as far as his per personal life, that was what was interesting to try and dig into. And I think Michael was. That was one of the things that Michael tried to ping me on a lot, which was in the early life, what was he like? What was going on? There was just nothing or nothing we could get our hands on because up until that point, he didn't really have newspapers writing about him. But but I think in general, it just his personal life is, I mean, I think you'll you'll see get a flavor for it in the actual book itself, but it's just he's just an adventurer, just a very curious guy. And I think Michael's kind of like him, right, Michael? You're very curious, just wanting to learn more and and but in general, his personal life, I think, you know, it was just like, obviously, he was you know, constantly trying to learn something new. So I guess he got bored easily. Um, and then eventually, once he met his wife, then they had an act. And so then it became like, hey, we have a kid, we got to settle down. And so I think I just look at him look like a family guy. In, in yeah, a way. I think I think um, I, I didn't find anything obvious about his sexuality in any any specific direction. I know. Um, I mean, his childhood was definitely one of the things I, I struggled to try to figure out because there just was less documentation about it. Um, but, you know, his father does die fairly early on. Um, his mom moves them to Wyoming and then joins the Seventh-day Adventists. And then he's kind of raised by his brothers and sister. Um, and then he runs away and joins <laughs> the Wild West show and then the circus. And, you know, so he really does have this kind of adventurous spirit. Um, you know, he meets Catherine, I think, in the 1880s, 1890s, and they are a tandem act. And she was an act in her own right. And so kind of joining him was a, a big get. Um, and they, they really balanced each other quite nicely. Um, I think, and I didn't spend a lot of time with Juanita's information, um, but Juanita probably has more of an interesting um, sexual orientation story than, than Clavette, or at least that I could verify with Clavette or Catherine. Interesting. Um, I have a personal question that may involve a little bit of speculation, but you have this man who's been doing so much. He was a, he ran away to the circus. He became a magician, a shadow artist, and then an, a, a painter. Um, because he had so many different eras of his sort of career, do you ever, um, did he ever like sort of allude to maybe what he preferred to do? I know that he sort of settled down and everything and really had that really shift, that big sort of like lifestyle shift to painting. But is there any sort of like, did he have a true passion or maybe he just maybe that was part of the part of the draw that he never had they just did everything i mean i mean for me the the art and and chris you can obviously add or or correct if you need but i, I see the art it really is the culmination of all of his things you know i mean when he's being a shadow artist he's working with light and learning how light works and how shadows work um you know when he is um an acrobat or equilibrist you know he's he has to pay attention to how the body works and, you know, how muscles function and, you know, and, and being very aware of how he portrays himself. You know, he did a lot of his early posters and some of them just feature photographs of him. Um, and, you know, so I think the art really is the opportunity for him to bring all those pieces together. And, you know, whether he could have continued performing forever, you know, at a, at a certain point, your body doesn't let you <laughs> be an acrobat anymore. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know that there's something where, you know, he, wistfully he's like, oh, if only I could have been an acrobat for the rest of my life. <laughs> um, but it really did, did seem to me, at least, that the, the art was something that brought him a lot of satisfaction um, and was an opportunity to shine with all the different things he had done. 
Yeah, that sounds about right. I think he also alludes to it in his artwork. And actually, they've they've talked about a little bit his his style is um, the style where some of the gouaches where he doesn't paint over a line more than once, and he does it kind of with his body and in the wave and the movement. Of, he use, he talks about the moving form, you know, creating the fish that look like they're swimming and that kind of thing. And it's all based on his uh, painting style, which comes from a more acrobatic style. He straddled the era before and after the light bulb. So he knew about what light was with candles and then with actual regular light. So again, the light and being a magician and quick sketch or quick uh, sleight of hand type of situation, you know, with light, he was able to kind of put that into paintings. But I'd have to say, if it was me, I'd say spot on uh, painting. Because he, he really does talk a lot about how he liked his painting. And so I think if you had to say, something that would be the culmination of all that but yeah for sure painting <laughs> all right so i think we only have one little one last little question um rita would like to know what is the instagram handle um to find these mini documentaries that you that you've talked about oh merton clivet or merton clivet okay. so a lot of them are a lot of them are actually at merton clivet so just m-e-r-t-o-n-c-l-i-v-e-t-t-e -T -T -E. And that's on Instagram. And so you'll see some of the, and actually the little mini documentary, the little 20 seconds, they're great. Cause it, it's, some of them are in the voice of a carnival barker and they've got imagery of sort of his, his Orpheum circuit and it's got this crazy voice. And so it's edited. And then some of them are more normal. Some of them, we have a longer one that talks about the village vamps and it's got some music behind it. So it's sort of like, it's kind of like with some horn section and kind of thing, they'll have music as well. But yeah, Merton Clavette, is uh, the handle you want to take a look at. And you can obviously see they, you know, when you look at it, they're on a reel, so you can kind of see. Great. We also, we also have the, uh, the other handle is uh, for Writers LLC. That's more of the business, but we have other kind of the book stuff and kind of a, amalgamation of different things. And then of course, the Great Clavet is, um, we're not doing, I guess that's Michael's thing, Great Clavet handle, but that's not a lot there, but on the actual Clavet, um, Great Club at website is uh, where you can get there is some information about him and the raffle and whatnot too but clubet.com actually has a lot of information if you're just curious about you know some of the documents because we've actually posted if there's links to a lot of the pdf articles old old articles from like new york times and different things like that you can get to so it's kind of a sort of a nice place to house all the information yeah oh nice um we actually have one last question that i actually um, passed over. Um, did you use VOD, um, Tessa says, did you use Vaudeville News in your research? Vaudeville News, do, do, we, have, do we have anything of that on that, uh, Michael? I can't, that doesn't I'm, sound. I'm, I'm trying to remember, I know, um, I, I did reach out to a couple of the Vaudeville organizations that are existing currently, and I'm trying to remember if that was one of them or not. Um, I know that you had, and I think it was I think it was Jason's son made a spreadsheet of all the the articles and uh -huh. magazines that he appeared in. Um, I'll, I'll have to look, but I can I can certainly I can certainly leave a note and reference that to follow up. I, I don't know off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Yeah, they definitely there was a lot of we 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 did build out that database. There's actually a lot of articles <laughs> in there. There's actually we actually and we and we cataloged every image that we had. And where it is so if we need to find it we can and so there's like articles for or there's there's applications to enter the magic uh, association and, and letters from people and it's just there's a lot out there it's just um but as far as that that would have been more of along the lines of my original idea for the documentary if i did a longer documentary and i did an actual my my new my, the new documentary would be more of like have a narrator talk about him have some sort of have some recreations with obviously cinematic looking with maybe Clavette in a, on a studio and shot in black and white. And then also some music and some maybe some footage from New York and some other places, some, some stock footage. But my original idea, which would have been more to try and find people who know about vaudeville, who know about the Orpheum circuit, who know about these kind of things, and you interview them more in a normal interview type um, situation on it you know where they do like interviews with documentaries documentarians but 
but that would have been something I would have tried to find is be like somebody who was an expert on vaudeville today who could say, yeah, you know, during that time, you know, he traveled around, so he must have been on, you know, one of the better circuits and, and here's what you could learn from that. And here's what you know a little bit more about who he was at that time through the eyes of somebody now who's an expert. But, but that's, that was all just before when we were trying to throw that out to the universe to see who might come forward. Uh, I think the way we have the documentary now, we can, it's more contained. We can, we can control it more and not be so reliant on trying to go out and find a bunch of experts because it's just, I don't have the time to try and find everybody, but but now we definitely would try and get as much as we can. If there's, if somebody knows more about it, we'd definitely take a peek. All right. So I think that's all I have for questions so far. You two have been absolutely great. It's fun, wonderful to learn about such a fascinating man. Um, for everybody else, we will have a recording of this that will be sent out mm -hmm. with a follow-up email as well as on our YouTube. And we'll also provide a link to the um, Instagram so you can see all the 20 second um, um, videos that have already been made about Martin Quebec. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Hey, Michael, one, one last thing. I mean, I guess the only last thing we'd be is, you know, we may attempt to try and get out there in uh, September. We'll see. Oh, yeah. Uh, the at the uh, September. Yeah, so. the village trip. That would be. That'd be a lot of fun. We're still trying to figure out if there's a way to make that work. And we'd love to come out that way and see. So well, great. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna end this webinar right here. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your evening. Thanks a lot, Thanks. Maya. You Thanks, too. Leanne. Yep. All right.